thanks for joining me, Dr. Jamar Tisby, to discuss your latest book, The Spirit of Justice. So first thing I want to dive into, of course, is the title. Uh, where did that idea come from? And of course, uh, what do you mean by the spirit of justice? I, I, I'm not sure if I first heard it from Merle Evers Williams or if it was something I had thought of and, and then it just reverberated when I heard her say it again. But I can definitely trace it to December 2017, the grand opening of the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. There was a, a press conference with Merle Evers Williams. A journalist asked her, how does the 21st century and what we were going through at that point um, compare to the 1960s and the civil rights movement? And she said, you know, I'm seeing things that I hoped I would never see again. And uh, she said, I don't mind telling the press I'm weary. And now, mind you, at this point, she's in her 80s. And then she said something that astounded me. She said, but there's something about the spirit of justice. And she said, it rises up and it makes you determined all over again. And something clicked in me and said, that's it. That's what's remarkable uh, about justice. It's not that there's evil in the world. It's not that people do wrong things. That happens all the time. What's remarkable is there are always people who rise up to resist it. And so to me, the spirit of justice is that through line. It is that commonality between, it's the difference between people who choose to remain silent and those who speak up, those who choose to remain passive and those who are active. And, you know, for people of faith, I think we can think of the whole, the, the spirit of justice as the Holy Spirit inspiring us to assert our God-given dignity as image bearers and uh, people made in the likeness of God. And, um, you know, I'm kind of going piece by piece here, starting with the title, but also the cover, the dust jacket, the cover yes. of the book. I've identified those three individuals, which I think, you know, maybe on the, uh, I think on Amazon's website, there's a little description of who right. uh, the individuals are, but it's Coretta Scott King, Elias Camp Morris, and Anna Murray Douglas. Um, obviously, an intentional choice. The book covers are very important. So why did those three make it to the cover? So <laughs> I think I was giving people too much credit because most people, like, they can't even identify Coretta Scott King, unfortunately. Oh, no. I'm like, wow, okay. Um, so, I, I mean, my hope was there would be one identifiable figures and two people that you kind of didn't recognize and wanted to know more about. Um, I wanted people from different eras. So you've got civil rights era. Um, you've got uh, the antebellum going into the Civil War era with Anna Marie Douglas. And then you've got the um, Jim Crow era with Elias Camp Morris. And each of these figures represents the spirit of justice in their own way. So hopefully it draws folks in. And then the background is like this red tint over a painting of um, enslaved people arriving on the shores of North America. So the backdrop is, you know, this black oppression, but in the foreground are the people who worked against it. And so is it safe to say that perhaps then one of these three figures uh, among the 50 inspired you the most, or is the person or one or two people that inspired you the most from the 50 you covered, uh, did they not make it to the cover? <laughs> I wish I could have put all 50 on the cover. Uh, they're inspirational in their own ways, really and truly. But, you know, my mind kind of comes back to a few figures. One is Sister Thea Bowman. Uh, she's born in Mississippi in the 1930s. She's uh, a, a Black girl who ends up going to a Roman Catholic school in her tiny town. And she's got a really tender heart for the things of God. Uh, gets baptized into the Roman Catholic Church as a as a young girl, and then as a teenager, senses a call to holy orders and ends up becoming a nun. Um, and she's highly intelligent. She goes on to get her PhD, and she becomes an educator, and she's also passionate about racial reconciliation and racial justice. She's also coming up in the Roman Catholic Church during the 1970s and 80s, where there's this transition from civil rights to black power, from saying Negro to black. And the way that works out in the Roman Catholic Church is black priests and congregation members are like, yo, this predominantly white male clergy has been telling us what to believe, how to believe, what to say, how to say. We have our own voice. We have our own agency. And so she comes along as a, a woman who 
is encouraging the Roman Catholic hierarchy to let black people have some self-determination within the Roman Catholic Church and to truly make the church universal, as its name implies. And, you know, speaking of Bowman and, you know, there's uh, Coretta Scott King and uh, Anne Marie Douglas, like you, the women are peppered throughout the various chapters in the book and you dedicate a specific section uh, to women. Um, but I, oh, I really want to touch on Anne Marie Douglas mm -hmm. um, for a minute, because like Coretta Scott King, there are women that are often overshadowed <laughs> by the accomplishments and the notoriety of their husbands. Um, so I was kind of uh, impressed to see uh, her highlighted, because honestly, out of the books I've read, all I know was, you know, she was Douglas's first wife. No one has right. really taken the time to break down her history, her contribution, how she supported him so he could be right. great, you know? Yeah. Um, so talk about that a little bit. We wouldn't know Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist, had Anna Murray Douglas not helped him escape and then support him throughout his work. So what's interesting about Anna Murray Douglas is she caught a lot of flack just for being Douglas's wife because she was unlettered. Whoa. She was not formally educated. Neither was Douglas, but obviously he was literate and, and very good with words. And so a lot of people were, were like, this is a mismatch. Like she's not your, e which couldn't have been further from the truth, right? right so right. number one, she's a seamstress. She uses her um, uh, sewing skills to sew the sailor's uniform that he uses as a disguise during his escape. She also borrows freedom papers, which would serve as a kind of fake ID if anyone stopped him. And then one of the things that really astounded me was I just didn't think about the fact that for years, Frederick Douglass was considered a fugitive slave. And so she was harboring a fugitive in her home such that if she got caught, she would have been in trouble, too. And then not only that, he was broke. He was just out of slavery. He didn't have no money. So, so she supported them. And then. He goes on all these long speaking tours. At one point, he's gone in Europe for two years straight. And she's raising their kids. And she opens their home as an, a, a stop on the Underground Railroad for abolitionist means, all this stuff. So there would not be a Frederick Douglass as we know him had it not been for Anna Murray Douglas. That kind of lends into because, you know, some people might look at her contribution and maybe want to downplay it or devalue it a bit. Uh, so that brings me to earlier on in your book where you kind of make the take the time to mention uh, resistance, advocacy, and activism mm -hmm. and their differences and commonalities. Um, so why did you think it was necessary, especially early on, to kind of draw out those distinctions? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. I think it's important. Look, I included a breadth of figures doing a wide variety of activities, some we may not initially think of as like justice oriented, like having a family. I categorize that as resistance because anything you do to assert your humanity in a world that is bent against you is a form of resistance. And it can be mundane. It can be writing poetry. It can be going for a walk outside. It can be uh, starting a school, whatever it might be, right? That's resistance, but it may not be conscious resistance, right? You getting a good night of sleep is not necessarily you consciously thinking I'm sticking it to white supremacy, right? But it is because it's built on, you know, black labor exploitation and the lack of rest, right? But you may not be conscious of it while you're doing it. Advocacy is more conscious and it's a supportive role primarily. It amplifies, it builds awareness. I think for a lot of people, especially white folks in like 2020 with the racial justice uprisings, they got catalyzed. And so they started sharing posts on social media. They started, you know, attending events, reading books, hosting book clubs. Those kinds of things are, are advocacy. You're amplifying, you're building awareness. But then there's another step or another category of resistance, which would be activism. And I think that's what we traditionally think of. It's the marches, it's the protests, it's the boycotts, it's the community organizers, the nonprofit leaders, the people on the front lines, sometimes literally putting their bodies on the line for justice. These are the folks advocates, you know, sort of prop up and lift up and support, um, but they're more direct, uh, you know, front lines folks. So talk to me a bit about, because you make an emphasis about this too, that if we're going to talk about history, especially, especially if you want to claim the heroes, quote unquote, uh, you know, we got to tell the whole truth. 
Come on, um, yes. And, you know, we're living in a time right now where, we, you know, people want to have revisionist history. Um, they want to control what kids and younger students are taught. Uh, so why is it important to tell the truth, especially when we're looking at history? I just think we need these stories now. We are facing a, honestly, a white lash to what we saw in 2020. Uh, we don't have to get into this, but in many ways, it's a white lash to the first black president <laughs> and, and what happened there. So, you know, most recently, you know, no sooner did we have these historic racial justice uprisings in 2020, the calendar turns over to 21 and we have an insurrection. The Confederate flag in the, the U.S. Capitol building, right? So that's part and parcel of what else has happened. The rise of white Christian nationalism, anti-CRT, defunding DEI, uh, uh, rolling back affirmative action provisions, uh, opposing African-American studies curricula. This, this is an opposition to history on two fronts. One, it's an opposition to this triumphant, heroic story of American history that's one of perpetual progress. Yeah, we had these blemishes of slavery and segregation in the past, but we're over it now. See, America is fundamentally good and we always eventually do the right thing. It goes against that narrative. The other thing that opposing this history does is it robs us of our power. See, if we knew the stories, if we knew uh, about Anna Murray Douglas, if we knew how Coretta Scott King struggled and thrived and fought even after her husband's assassination, if we knew about uh, Paul Cuffey and Robert Smalls and, and the rest, then we might sense our own power to continue to resist and to continue work for justice. So it, this is subversive history, and it's a history that we need right now to continue to move toward a more perfect union. The Evangelicals for Harris call. Yes. Um, so, are you an, an Evangelical for Harris? No. Why? Why not? <laughs> so, so I, intro I introduced myself as a Christian for democracy. You see yeah. what I did there? Um, yes. So, uh, I, you know, there there was space in in the way it was pitched to me in the invitation for evangelical adjacent people. Uh, that's where I would put myself. I simply call myself a black Christian, but I know evangelicals, even if I don't use the label myself. And so I felt, you know, some uh, uh, interest in speaking to that group. And then and then for Harris, I mean, for me, it's not like a, a, a sort of blanket endorsement. Uh, it, it, it's It's just saying that in this two party system, when the choices are Trump and Harris, I'm 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 voting for Harris because I want to preserve the peaceful transfer of power. I value basic ad adherence to facts and truth, right? And obviously there are ways and um areas that we need to push this administration on. But we can do that whereas if with the other party and the other candidate, you know, the people in general would have no say. He's answering to a very narrow constituency, if any at all. Yeah, and so I kind of want to just briefly touch on um, this whole Project 2025 thing, right? Yeah. It's this ultra-conservative or extremist blueprint for kind of mm -hmm. refashioning the federal government under a Republican president. Um, and a lot of people have been, you know, ringing the alarm and whatnot. Um, but do you think this is something that is could realistically come to pass? Absolutely. Uh, the first Trump administration was a dry run. January 20, January 6, 2021 was a dry run. The infrastructure for willfully subverting democracy wasn't quite in place. You even had Republicans and other conservatives uh, like the, the secretary of state in Georgia. We're like, no, 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 we're not going to just, you know, overrule the will of the people. Project 2025, 900 plus pages all kinds of in and outs, but fundamentally what it wants to do is replace key figures with folks who are loyal to Trump and will do whatever he wants. That's do you the think key. he really wants to be like a dictator? <laughs> like, I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's one end where people are seeing this going. Oh, is that like alarmist? How do you feel about that? This is my opinion. Yes. I think fundamentally, Trump wants to be the center of attention. He stumbled into winning a presidency that even he didn't think he could win. And then he can send a tweet and the whole world pays attention. 
that kind of attention that kind of focus, that kind of everyone listens to me is unparalleled. And I think he will do absolutely anything to get back there. I think he's actually less interested in power than some people are. Um, but he will use authoritarian style tactics to make sure that he stays the center of attention. So to me, I think fundamentally Trump is about attention and the presidency is a means to an end. and if his pathway to the presidency subverts democracy, then so be it. Okay, fair, fair. And, you know, <laughs> we're having all kinds of discussions right now. I mean, we have true Christians and fake Christians <laughs> as the uh, discussions are going, right? Yeah. Always during the political season, especially. So how do you personally stay resilient amid the kind of discord we're seeing in general, in society, but also this infighting, right, in Christianity and the name calling, you know, especially with the attacks on education, educators, equity, equality, et cetera, and then even attacks on your faith. So how do you keep a level head and a resilient spirit? It's real in these streets. Um, I, I think fundamentally the most important thing for me to sort of keep my head about me is is you find your people. And and here's the thing that that folks don't see on the other side of an exiting, a deconstructing, a decolonizing journey is you only see what you're leaving. You only see the community that you're losing. You don't anticipate the community that you gain on this journey of justice. And so that for me has been the real sort of expression of the church. Um, the people who are the hands and feet of Jesus in the world, doing good in the world, but also loving well. So, you know, the group chat is a lifeline, right? Uh, when I when I can go to certain cities and visit people because we're all spread out. But but, you know, the long night over, you know, dinner and conversation, that's really recreation in the classic sense of recreating. Right. And then there are the, the it's to me, it's becoming much more about daily small habits and practices that keep you healthy. I have a stretching routine in the morning. I have a journaling routine. Uh, I have an exercise routine, right? Because I'm a very big believer and increasingly so in this mind-body-soul connection. So if we're not doing what we can to keep our bodies healthy and even our mental, you know, sort of more positive and, and um, expansive, it, all of this stuff gets harder. So it, it, it's self-care but not just in the let's go to a spa and do essential oils, but self-care on a, what does it look like a, on a daily practical basis? Finally, um, anything about the book uh, we didn't touch on that you want to make sure people are aware of? The, the question that kept popping up for me with this book mm -hmm. was how do we address the question of how do you keep going when it looks like you're not winning? Not all that long ago. A lot of us were resigned to another Trump presidency, an ascendant white Christian nationalism, uh, the the demoralizing state that that we experienced post COVID, post George Floyd, all of that stuff, and we had this brief glimmer of maybe things might change, and then not only did they go back, that we may have lost ground, right? So how do you stay in the struggle? How do you keep on fighting. And to me, it's these stories. Jesus spoke in stories, in parables, in narratives, A, so that people could understand, B, so that people would get inspired. It would teach us. So I end the book with four virtues. I talk about faith. I talk about hope. I talk about imagination um, and resilience. Uh, Courage, um, not hope. Hope was th throughout the book, but I talk about courage. And those are the things that I hope people get out of the book. I hope you get inspired to continue on this journey of racial justice by learning the real, true stories of people who came before us and because of their faith, tapped into the spirit of justice to keep fighting for a better world.